You're recording. Okay, thanks. Anybody have any questions before we start? How are you doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. Did a little, little fishing. We had a successful high school event here on campus. So, what did you catch? <laughs> Nothing. That was the part. I went fishing, but uh, I was kind of fishing for walleye, and it's a little bit early for fishing right now. for walleye anyway. So, uh, but I was trying some other things. It was nice to get out on the on the lake. And then I worked on my house that I'm renovating. And I got some stuff done there, so that's good. Sounds like work, but it's kind of fun. All right, so today we start chapter eight and nine. So this week we're covering eight and nine. And it's really a continuation of our three biggies that we're gonna do. And I never defined them as the three biggies. But, uh, so chapter eight's going to kind of bring in the other biggie. So chapter eight, um, so three big concepts. Number one, for macro, right, for macro. There's other big concepts, but the three biggies, the biggies that I want you to keep in mind are number one, real GDP, which we defined last time. What was so real about real GDP? Why did we call it real GDP? What was so real about real GDP? So this was the last chapter, last week's test, yesterday's test. Focus on quantity, Focus on quantity. great, Emily. So. Uh, it is the quantity of goods and services. So the quantity of beer, chicken wings, all that stuff. So the focus here on real GDP is the quantity of goods and services in the nation. So the focus is on the quantity. That's what's so real about real GDP. It's measured in dollars because we have to figure out how to add together apples and oranges, right? So 10 apples, 10 apples and uh, 12 oranges, we could say, oh, well this is how much stuff's in the economy. There's 22 units worth of stuff. 
Does that make much sense to actually add the quantities of apples and the quantity of oranges together? No. Remember the old saying, you can't add apples and oranges, right? Because it doesn't make sense to sum those together um, for most purposes. So what do we do? Well, we say, oh, well, oranges, uh, apples you can buy for $2 and oranges are $1. And so now we've got $20 worth of apples and $12 worth of oranges and we have $32 of the quantity of stuff, right? So we're trying to measure the quantity of things in the United States of America that ultimately uh, go to help feed and clothe and shelter and have fun and watch movies and other things of all the 330 million people that we have on in our nation's boundaries. Okay, so what's the other biggie that we did last week? What did we derive as we did no nominal GDP and real GDP? What was the other part that was important? Here's a hint. Here's a hint. This is just a hint. Prices. Prices, yes. So inflation in general. So we're gonna do, I'm gonna call the three biggies here uh, inflation rather than prices, but we learned how they're related to each other. So inflation was a focus on prices. So prices of the goods and services in the nation. It's useful to know what's happening to prices. Okay, and then this chapter, chapter eight, the focus is really on our next biggie, and that is unemployment, which we really didn't talk about much. There might have been a few mentions of it, but the third biggie is unemployment. So that's what we'll spend the most time on today. Unemployment, so people not working, right? to some degree, of some level. We'll get into definitions today. So unemployment. All right, and then what I want to add on to this to flavor it up is what direction do you think the, the society would like to see these things happening? In general, holding all of the things constant, would you want this going up or down, real GDP, if it's to show prosperity for the nation? Up or down? Up, right? We want more stuff more quantities of stuff. So we'd like to see GDP increasing. So I'm gonna insert here, increasing real GDP would be our desire is what I'm writing in red. What about inflation? Do we want that increasing? No, not necessarily. You know, do we want it uh, high or low? What would we pick? Probably low. Uh, should it be zero? There's a little bit of, uh, of um, disagreement there among the field. I don't have any problem with 0% inflation. Some people say, oh, it's good to have a little bit of it. So where we're going to compromise here with inflation from society standpoint is to have it low and stable. Low and stable inflation should be our goal. So we're kind of laying out policy goals of what we think would be good for society. Let's have the quantity of stuff we get to eat and drink and have fun with could be going up while the price of those things remains low and stable. Does that sound like a good place to be from what we learned last week, right? Low and stable prices of the things we like and the actual quantity of things is going up. That's economic prosperity, that would be economic growth. Okay, and then finally, unemployment. Unemployment. Do we want that? If I, if I only gave you the answers of high or low, what would you pick? Low, right? We kind of know that that one would probably want to be low. Um, is zero the goal? Zero unemployment. Zero unemployment. So I hear some people thinking no. So let's eliminate, you know, you can almost hear a presidential candidate. We're going to eliminate unemployment under my regime. Uh, everybody uh, can work for the government, so nobody will be unemployed. 
You know, you can almost hear maybe a policy being thrown out like that from a political candidate down the road, maybe. So we're going to eliminate unemployment, kind of like trying to eliminate poverty or something. We're going to eliminate unemployment. Our goal is to have zero unemployment. So those of you who are kind of thinking no, and by the way, I agree with you, why would that not be ideal? Are you saying there's some good unemployment? What, what is, what, 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 give me some good aspects of unemployment. What would you think is, potentially has a, maybe it's a silver lining, right? I mean, does unemployment kind of suck for the person who doesn't have a job and, and is looking for one? Yeah. But what's kind of the silver lining for society that we wouldn't necessarily want to eliminate all unemployment? Can you think of some things? Okay, to be able to change between jobs might be a healthy thing, right? In a dynamic economy, good. Other things come to mind. So the ability to change jobs, if you, if you can't change jobs, then that's one way to try to reduce unemployment. By the way, that's been tried over in India and some other places still currently. India's kind of gotten away from this, but basically if you got hired for a job, you had it for life. You couldn't be fired. And you're thinking, oh, that'd be cool. But what do you think the uh, workers did a little bit if they knew they couldn't be fired? They start Yeah, start slacking off, right? What economists call shirking on the job, like just not doing your stuff. Um, so that can cause some problems for unemployment as well. All right, so we'll, we'll build on this today because this is really going to be our, our main theme. But unemployment, we want to be low. How low, we'll kind of talk about, but imagine we live in a, an economy where we seem to have more boats to water ski behind and more beer and more chicken wings every year while the prices of that stuff remains pretty stable and unemployment's low. Does that sound like a country you'd like to live in? Right, low unemployment, low and stable prices and lots of quantity going up over time. So, yeah, it sounds pretty good, right? So that's kind of our setup here. Well, one of the reasons why we're measuring this stuff is in order to have goals for the economy, we have to kind of know where we're at. And so last uh, chapter, last week, we learned how to quantify this, how to measure this. We learned how to measure this. And so chapter eight is really shifting the focus on to measuring unemployment. Okay, so um, I think I'm gonna go ahead and start with that since we got such a nice kickoff to this. So unemployment. Um, is everyone not working unemployed? In other words, if you don't have a job, you're unemployed. Is everyone that's not working currently in the United States, would you call them unemployed? Seeing some head shaking. Give me some examples. Emily, I saw your head shake the first time. Can you give me an example of one person in the United States who's not working that you wouldn't say is unemployed? A child. Yeah, a child, yeah. So how about a little baby, right? So less than 16 years of age. Um, now we can have employment at 15, but let's, so let's do an example of a, a baby. And three month old baby. Three months old. That kid's not working. Do, is there such a thing as a baby who is making some money at three months? Yeah, yeah you've seen them on TV, right? A little advertisement or uh, maybe on a TV show or something, they needed a baby to stand in. Um, so they needed, the, the Gerber baby is kind of the, one of the famous babies that's been on uh, the side of stuff for a long time. Of course, that baby uh, was developed way back probably 80 years ago. I can't remember how old, but. So a baby. Who else is not working that is what you wouldn't consider unemployed? Homeless people. Homeless people, okay. So I want you to expand on that. I mean, because you really think about it, like they're not really like, they don't have a job. Okay, no job, yeah. They don't have a job. So they really like, what are they doing besides trying to find a way to live? That's all, that's all they're doing. But they're truly like, they work a job. So they're not really looking for a job, is what you're saying. Yeah. So well, some of them are. Some, some, some of them are, 
but some of some are actually like you know you might see them like oh can I wash her car uh, what is that uh, windshield for like yeah five bucks or whatever so some of them do try to find a way to work but so if they're actually, looking for a job would you call them unemployed um, no if they're looking for a well, job yeah because they they haven't found a job yeah if they haven't found it so. Homeless people, let's put, let's qualify this one then. This is my list of people who are not working that are on the floor. I'd say homeless people not looking for a job. If they are, you know, currently just not looking for work and they're choosing not to be looking and maybe they're working from couch to couch and uh, tent to tent and whatever, if they're truly not looking for work, then that's their situation. Okay, somebody else now besides Emily and Jay. Who else can you think of in the United States that is not working, but you wouldn't really call them unemployed? Robert, come on. I know you're chopping at the bit. I'll give you a hint, gray hair. Old people, Old people yes, so retirees, right? So how about retired people not looking, we might as well add that. So they currently have a million dollars to their name and they're, they've worked hard their whole life and they're retired and so they are, that was the whole point of working hard and saving hard for the last 40 years is that they're not working. Okay. So there ends up being a lot of people that are out there. Can you give me some examples between baby? Give me a give me a 40 year old that is not that you wouldn't call as unemployed. 40 year old female or male, it doesn't really matter on the gender. Uh, in the military. Hold on, let me I want to open up so somebody other than Robert, Emily and Jay. Oh, okay. Who's up? Emily's just dying. She's got a good one. Robert, number between three and eight. Okay, I gotta get to the people up here. Kennedy, got it. Can you unmute? Maybe I'm gonna do a special. We'll get back to the number theory later. Kennedy, I saw you. There you go. Okay. And you got a camera today? There we go. Okay. How you doing? So when you use Zoom, you got to keep your cameras on. So Kennedy, since I have you now unmuted and everything, give me a 40-year-old person who you think is not working, but you wouldn't call them unemployed. I feel like this is the family feud type of thing. Give me the name of a person who's not working that you wouldn't call unemployed. Like a stay-at-home parent? Okay, good. A stay-at-home parent. That's kind of one of them that I was looking for, right? So stay-at-home mom or dad, because they're watching their kids or whatever. So stay-at-home mom or dad. So one spouse is working. The other is doing work, like we talked about last chapter of watching kids is work a lot of times. Sometimes it's enjoyable. Sometimes you want to wring their little necks, right? But they're choosing to not be working. And so they're not unemployed. Okay, Emily, you got one last one you wanna chop at the bit or you're chopping for? Disabled person. Disabled person, okay. And of course there are jobs uh, for disabled people, not even for, but I should say regular jobs that disabled people can do. So we gotta be careful if it is a disabled person, again, choosing not to work. Or, or look, they're not looking, they're not wanting. And yes, they might have uh, uh, disability checks coming, but the disability check does not make them unemployed or employed, right? So that fact alone, don't, don't think that those two are, are linked together somehow, they're not. So the key thing with all of this then, the thread that I was looking for you to kind of pick out is that they're not working, but they're also not looking, right? So that's what we have for people who are unemployed. You have to be not working, but you also have to be looking. If you're looking and not working, 
you are unemployed. Okay, so let's kind of write that out here. <clears throat> so unemployed, so to be unemployed, by definition, now we're gonna get a little governmental here. Um, you are 16 years of age or older. So 16 years old or more, not working, and not seeking or looking, not seeking employment. I'm sorry, and seeking. <laughs> Get rid of that not word there. Let's just go back to my look word. So not working, uh, but looking, maybe I should say. Oh, you guys are using it. Not working and looking. So this is called, a little more precisely, actively seeking employment. So looking for a job. And I did kind of screw up, I should look at my notes a little closer. 16 years of age or more, not institutionalized. Not institutionalized. Take a stab, what does it mean to be institutionalized by government definition? Where are you? Jail, jail. yes, so you're in jail or you're hospitalized, or you're in a, a insane asylum or something, right? Some sort of institution to where you're kind of there, uh, not through voluntary means. You're, you're in jail or you're whatever. So that is not institutionalized. So basically you're free to get a job. You're 16 years of age or older, but you can't find work. All right, so our next definition then is the labor force. The labor force we want to think of as the fraction of the population that could potentially work or is working. So the, the largest amount in the labor force is the number of people working. The number employed plus the number unemployed. So it's an equation. We've got the number of people working and the number of people not working but looking. Does that make sense? That's the labor force for the United States. Okay, does anybody know what the unemployment rate is currently, approximately, in the United States? No, way lower. Really? We approached 20% during COVID because the government forced people to lose their jobs, right? 14, All the restaurant workers. 13. Like way lower. Yes, Emily's on it. Three something, like 3.8 or 3.9. So we're back to, we've actually recovered back to about where we were pre-COVID. Um, tomorrow, I'm hoping, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that the projector will come back. I knew we had some people on Zoom that were sick or otherwise, um, and so I didn't want to do what I did last time with showing you some stuff. But we got some cool stuff that we'll look at tomorrow. Hopefully the projector will be on or I'll figure out how to use it there. Um, but yeah, the, the unemployment rate is at really some historical lows still. Um, I, from an economist standpoint, I suspect it's not gonna stay there, unfortunately, but that is where it's at. So the unemployment rate is our next statistic. The unemployment rate, which we'll just use a big U for the unemployment rate, it is a fraction. It's this 3.8%. And it is just the number of unemployed, the number of people unemployed divided by the labor force. So that fraction is what makes up the unemployment rate. So all we've done is we've taken the number of people who aren't working but looking, 
and we've divided it by the total enchilada. Sometimes you'll see on your homework or otherwise, another way of doing this is if we take the, the uh, employment rate, we could take one minus the employment rate uh, is another way to do it. So one minus the number employed, which is the employment rate, which means that's about 97%, right? 96.2% is the employment rate right now. Um, so one minus the 96% gives you the 3%. And so you can also think about the employment rate is another way to think about unemployment. All right. Um, so let's do a little breakdown. Any questions on that? Kind of some of the mechanics. So here's a breakdown of the United States. So U.S. data. This data is a little bit old, but it's kind of, uh, again, I would have showed it when it is. When is this, 2006? But that's all right, U.S. data. So what is the population? So the population, let's just say, at this time was around 300,000. 300 million, sorry. And then we have the working age population. which was 229 million. So working age population is what we're tying this back to, the 16 years of age and older. So we got about 70 million kids on our little island we all live on. About 70 million kids, if you consider a kid to be 15 years of age or younger, we've got about 70 million kids. All right, then we've got the labor force. So the labor force of all of these 16 year olds or older, the labor force was 153 million. So these statistics remain about true year after year. About half of the United States population works. They're either working or looking, so they're part of the labor force. All right, questions or comments on that? All right, so the labor force participation rate how many people choose to be a part of the working of the population? So we call that the participation rate. The labor force participation rate is the labor force divided by the WAP. The WAP is this working age population. So we got to get some of these statistics out. I know it's a little bit boring, but we'll get there. So the labor force participation rate, you know, how much is it here with these numbers? We've got 153, we've got a calculator handy, divided by 229. Has anybody got a non-phone calculator? Maybe you got your laptop open. If you got a calculator handy, what's 153 divided by 229? Your phone needs to be right back in here. What'd you get? 
0 0.66. So 0 0.66, and then give me one more digit. 8. So that is 66%. So this is kind of a nice number to think about, all right, um, the, how many people that are work, of, of working age, 16 years of age of older, how many of those people are choosing to work or looking for work? About two thirds of them. So we've got about two thirds of the, of the working age population that's looking for work. So that's kind of, it starts to get our arms around the United States situation here. And this is stuff that can be tracked at year after year. So our last one for this is the employment to population ratio. And this equals the number of people employed divided by the working age population. So how many people are working as a part of the working age population? So notice that it's kind of similar to the employment rate but here we were talking about the labor force, only the people that want to be working. Here we've got kind of the whole population in mind. Okay, questions or comments on that? I would have been showing you some real world stuff that we'll hold off for tomorrow. All right. So let's get back to describing why people are unemployed with types of unemployment. So we talked about babies, we talked about retirees, disabled people, people in institutions. So what is, let me get rid of this. So we got three types or types of unemployment. So the first type is frictional unemployment. Frictional unemployment. So I think frictional unemployment is the one that um, you guys first brought up that it just doesn't seem healthy. You want the ability to change jobs and you might not have another job lined up right away, and, and that's okay. That's just part of the part of the system that we that we live in. And so that's what frictional unemployment is: is kind of normal job market turnover. Normal job market turnover. So some examples would be quitting your job, quitting your job without having another lined up. So an old country western singer, uh, Conway Twitty, I think, uh, sang one time, take this job and shove it. I ain't working here no more. You guys hear that song before? I know I don't have the best voice in there, but it's kind of a fun song, right? Take this job and shove it. You tell your employers, like, that's the last time you're going to tell me to do that and not be respectful of me, right? Is that a sign of a healthy economy and a good job market that somebody would pull out the double birds and say, take this job and shove it? without having another job lined up? Is that the sign of a potentially healthy job market that somebody feels free enough to tell their employer to shove it and walk out without having another job lined up? Is that the sign of a healthy job market? 
in general in the economy or a healthy economy or the sign of a weak economy? David, what were you thinking? Healthy, why? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's really the sign of a healthy economy. We're always gonna have bad bosses out there that you're gonna get really irritated with and you having the freedom to say, take this job and shove it because you're gonna quit that job and you know that well, I can just go walk down the road, right? There's another person willing to hire me with my type of skills that's going to be a lot more respectful of me. That's the sign of a healthy economy. So that's kind of okay, um, you know, uh, in terms of the economy's perspective. Again, this person might be unemployed for a period of time, but it's the sign or it's the signal of a healthy economy. Another example of frictional unemployment would be new entrants new entrance to the labor force. New entrance to the labor force. So you guys are gonna be a new entrant. So you've been working hard, doing your sport, and uh, let's see if this will work here. I got an important prop here to, this thing might work better. We'll, we'll try this one, see how it works. So. So let's see, who am I? Da, 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 da. Woo! Now I gotta find a job. Is that bad for society or good for society that you just graduated, you threw the hat, and you said, now I gotta find a job? and you start looking. Is that good for society or bad for society? That's good, That's good right? We got a newly educated worker, and the only problem is they don't have a job yet, right? But are they unemployed? Yeah, as soon as they start looking, when we throw the hat, you might have been not unemployed prior to the ceremony because you were so busy with mom and dad coming to town and having a graduation party, and you didn't really think about that much about a job. You certainly weren't looking but as soon as you start Googling uh, and trying to find a job, just like that, you're unemployed. You become unemployed just like that, right? That's unemployment. That's another example of frictional unemployment. So we could have new graduates as a sign of frictional unemployment. So new college grads. Okay, so there's, we kind of expect an economy to have some unemployment, and that's why we didn't want it to be zero, and it's especially with this particular type of unemployment. All right, questions or comments on that one? Number two, structural unemployment. Structural unemployment occurs when we have job skills that don't match up with job requirements. So maybe there's been a technological change and you are out of a job. So structural unemployment are situations where uh, people are unemployed, people are unemployed because they're job skills have become obsolete. Obsolete. What does obsolete mean? That's not a word we use too much in our day-to-day -day language. Obsolete. If something's become obsolete, and I got a general gut feeling for that one? No Emily? I'm sorry. Okay, something that's no longer produced or used. So yeah, you are an awesome VCR repairman, right? You, uh, you, I've got the best skills to repair VCRs. I can, I can repair any VCR just like that. And so how many VCRs are out there to repair nowadays? No. Not too many. There might be some that are trying to be revived, uh, but you don't have a job, right? So then we can talk horse and buggy, VCR. So VCR, horse and buggy. 
um, you know, anything that is not around anymore. So these are all obsolete goods due to technological change. Is that type of unemployment good or bad for society? Is this a bad thing for the economy that we're having structural unemployment? Is it bad that we don't still use VCRs? Yeah, new technology, right? So we learned about that with the production possibilities frontier. If we have a technological advance, and that helps uh, us not need as many people to make pizzas with the new pizza oven. It sucks that you got unemployed, so it sucks for you, but hopefully you can get a new job fairly fast. If it's a healthy labor market, you can find a new job with new skills, or maybe you have to go back to school or learn a different uh, um, skill set somehow. But from society standpoint, we learned about the benefits of technological change, right? That we're all made better off. So again, structural unemployment is one that is good for society. All right, so our last type of unemployment is cyclical unemployment. I guess I didn't write the word unemployment each time, but cyclical unemployment. All right, so cyclical unemployment is due to kind of the ups and downs of the economy. So cyclical unemployment, oh, I'm getting so excited singing songs and everything, my shit's coming on now. All right, so cyclical unemployment occurs when there's a general downturn of the economy. So occurs when there is a general downturn of the economy. So a recession, which we're going to define here in a little bit too. So the economy just seems to be not doing so hot, and therefore I lose my job. All right, so I guess maybe this is a good spot to kind of bring this in um, right underneath the cyclical. So we have what we call the business cycle. So the business cycle is fluctuations in real GDP over time. Fluctuations in real GDP over time. So let's just draw kind of a simple graph to, to think about this. On the horizontal axis, we're just going to be measuring time. So it could be, you know, the, the year 1990, 2000, 2010, 2020. So we're measuring time on the horizontal axis. And then real GDP on the vertical axis. So this is our quantity stuff that we let off for definitions of the three biggies. And then you might want to watch me draw this first. So this goes through ups and downs. And so it might go up and down and up and down a little bit. But over time, what's happening to GDP? Is it going up or down? According to the graph I just drew, that's why I wanted you to watch me draw it first. It's going up, right? So one of the things we do with this is to uh, show what the trend is. So on average, you guys can do your ups and downs however you want, but the main thing is when you do your ups and downs, I want you to show a trend line that's going up. So that is economic growth over time, if it is going up. So 
So it's kind of the average pace of the economy. And the way I have it drawn here, that is economic growth, which is what we measured last chapter. Chapter seven was the percentage change in real GDP over time. Okay, so now what this gives rise to is the four phases of the business cycle. So there's four pipes with the fluctuations. And it's pretty simple, really. It's just self-defining. It's either going up or it's going down, or it's come to a peak or it's come to a trough. So it bottomed out. So if we take a look at this, you guys could pick anywhere you want. When the economy's growing, this phase here, it is expanding. So this is an expansion of the economy up to the blue line. And then it hits a peak. And then it goes down until it hits this other bottom part here. So right in here is called recession or contraction. Recession has a little bit more detail to it. So this is recession. And then it bottoms out and this is called the trough. So as we move through time, we have that part of the, of the business cycle going on. So we've got the four phases of the business cycle. So number one, the way I have them there, it doesn't matter what the order is, but an expansion, which is increasing real GDP. The economy is expanding. So on a graph, over time, it's the area that I define there. Number two, it comes to a peak. So you can think of this as the upper turning point. The upper turning point where the economy is now gonna start heading south. Number three is a recession. So GDP is going down and then um, one of the uh, Definitions for recession is a two-quarter decline of GDP. Recession is defined as a two-quarter decline in real GDP. How long is two quarters of the year? How many months? How many months are in a quarter? So how many months are in a two quarters? Six, right? So we have GDP going down for six months. So it's kind of this continuous fall. Sometimes GDP might go down for like three months, but then it rebounds. So we're not gonna call that a recession. So it kind of needs to be this two quarter decline in GDP. Otherwise, we might have had a small contraction, but we wouldn't label it a recession. And then we might as well throw this out for fun, too, under this one. You've heard of the Great Depression. There isn't really any formal definition. It's just a really bad recession. So it was more of almost a marketing thing that we called it the Depression. But this is just a really long, bad recession. There is no formal definition of what a depression is. So it really falls into this recession category, but it just was really depressing. So they call it the depression. Does anybody know what the unemployment rates were during the depression time frame, 1930s? So we just said that the unemployment rate today is 3.8%. What percent was it, do you think, back then during this Depression era? 20 would be pretty bad, 24, 25. 
So that's about where it was at. Imagine a fourth of the people that you walk to on the streets are wanting a job, but can't find a job, right? Our definition of unemployment, they're looking for a job, but they can't find it, a fourth of everybody. That is depressing, right? So depression era uh, unemployment was around 25%, 20 to 25% unemployment during the depression era. Okay, so then our last phase is the trough. And it can simply be defined as the lower turning point of real GDP. So the economy goes through these ups and downs, the ups and downs. So I kind of weaved this in here so that we could highlight how that relates to this type of unemployment. So when the economy is doing bad, I might lose my job, not because our product has become obsolete, right? Or not because my skills are no longer wanted. There just isn't enough people that want to buy our product. And so I'm going to have to lay you off, right? I'm going to have to fire you uh, because of that. All right, so questions or comments there? Does this one sound bad or good? Cyclical. Does this one sound bad or good? So we said frictional sounds good because it's kind of healthy, dynamic economy, and structural is uh, good in the sense of technological advance. What about cyclical? I lost my job just because the overall economy is going down. Does that sound good for society or bad? Bad, right? So that one doesn't sound quite as nice. There's not like good reasoning behind it just because there was a general downturn. And so in general, we'd like to avoid these highs and lows, right? Have you guys known some manic depressive people? Like they're really on a high, right? The manic is when they're like, oh, they're so fun to be around. It's so hyper and we gotta go to this and we gotta do this and I can do everything and all my homework's done and I'm doing number one in cheerleading and, and let's go, I, mean, I like this guy and the, 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 right? You almost can't stand it. And then the crash. And now, oh, I don't know what I'm gonna do with my life. I don't wanna go to school. I don't wanna do anything, right? So that type of life is a little stressful. Right? If you go through these really big highs and these really big lows, kind of the same thing for the economy. If we could somehow have a, a choice, which might be kind of hard, by the way, but if we, had, if we could take a smoother ride on this trip and still have the same average growth, a smoother ride would be better. Right? If we could somehow have maybe not quite the highs and lows, but still maintain the red line for growth, that would be preferred, um, if that's possible or if there's some things we can do. Okay, so let's write some of that down. So kind of key points. Um, let's just say number one, key points. Uh, there is a natural rate of unemployment for a healthy, dynamic, healthy and dynamic economy. There is a healthy and natural, or the, there's a natural rate for a healthy and dynamic economy that includes frictional and structural unemployment. So that is what we call the natural rate of unemployment. So this is kind of a new term here. So the natural rate of unemployment, the natural rate 
of unemployment, which I'm going to use the shorthand notation U subscript N. So the natural rate of unemployment is equal to the frictional rate plus the structural rate. So now when we think about our goals for the economy, it should be to squeeze out any cyclical unemployment. And so right now, I think you would not find any economist out there in the nation, which is surprising because economists like to disagree with each other, that right now we are either at or below the natural rate of unemployment. So it's possible to be almost too low. So the natural rate traditionally, and again, this has changed, uh, but I'd say still today, I'd say 90% of the economists would estimate the natural rate to be between four and 6%. So we don't really know how to estimate it exactly, but let's just say um, most economists estimate natural rate to be between four to six percent. I'd say you get most economists to agree. So that means if we're at 3.8 percent, we're probably below what would be expected in a healthy economy. So if that's the case, part of what we're saying is economists are in the prediction business. What would we predict the unemployment rate's going to do? Go up or down? It's going up, right? So we probably expect it to be more in this range. So we shouldn't expect it to fall to 2% or 1.5% uh, because we're always going to have uh, a healthy economy anyway with some frictional and structural uh, uh, unemployment. Okay, so the cyclical rate is the bad one. Which then raises the question of, can we get rid of the bad one? So I'll just kind of pose that. Is it possible to reduce cyclical unemployment? So let me just toss that one out to you guys. I know I've been writing a lot on the board here. Like I said, I would have liked to interject a few slides that we'll do tomorrow, but we'll, we'll hold off for that. Um, so the economy is going down. Is there anything that could be done to try to reduce it? Is it possible to reduce cyclical unemployment? Is there a government policy that could possibly attempt to reduce it? What could the government do? It's 
So a couple people lose their job because the economy is going down. What could the government do? Robert? Nice and loud, be brave. Extra credit pens definitely out, even if you have whatever you have to say. Yeah, so if the economy is going down, um, having a recession, right? So there's just kind of one of these general downturns. My question is, could the government intervene somehow to, to uh, help that person who's unemployed because of the economy going down? What could the government do? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So they could spend some money to create a new job. Emily? Okay, so do something like build a bridge or add internet, right? So if we, if we go build a bridge, we need 100 workers to go build a bridge, right? Now, when the government does that, though, they're spending money. Whose money? Taxpayers. Taxpayers. Now, do they always raise taxes when they spend more money? Do they always raise taxes when they spend more money? No. What, what can they do? Can they borrow money? Yeah. So then we're back to that national debt and deficit thing. So we're going we're gonna to slowly start to weave those concepts into here. So there's an old saying in economics that there's no such thing as a free lunch. And so it sounds good on the front end that, hey, we could just have the government hire some people. And maybe if we do really need a bridge or we need roads or something, maybe, maybe there's some value to that. Um, so they could put that person to work. But then the question is, what happens later? Does that policy actually work in the short term the same way it does in the long term? So that's part of what we're going to be teasing out of this course as we go through. So this is our first introduction to unemployment. So I'll, I'll write this question up here. This is hotly debated, right? So this is the big debate in economics. Big debate in economics. Is it possible to reduce cyclical unemployment? So maybe in the short run, government could build a road. But what happens in the long run? Or worse yet, what happens if we didn't need the road? Is it possible? Have you guys ever heard of the government building or fixing something that maybe didn't need to be fixed? Yeah, yeah right? So, you know, how do they determine that stuff? So if the road needed to be repaired, you got me going a little bit there that, that maybe that there's something there, but especially if the road didn't need to be repaired, but then also that road is gonna have to be paid for either with tax dollars or with uh, borrowing down the road. So how's that gonna happen? All right, so uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, let's see. So we're going to, bring in a couple other terms that connect unemployment. So connecting unemployment and real GDP. Connecting unemployment and real GDP. So full employment. Well, full employment in the economy is achieved when there is only the natural rate of unemployment. 
So in other words, when we only have frictional and structural unemployment, we say that the economy is fully employed. So right now, most economists would say that the United States is at full employment. Everybody who wants a job has a job. And so this is a pretty good sweet spot for the unemployment rate. All right, and so then we might think back, well, what is the potential for the economy? So the potential output, the potential um, output or real GDP, the production of the economy, the potential output or the potential real GDP is real GDP when the economy is at full employment of resources. So a couple definitions here that will carry on through the rest of the course, by the way. <laughs> All right, so potential output, let's redraw that graph a little bit. So give me some real GDP and then some ups and give me a couple ups and downs. And then we'll have that trend line, but I'm going to relabel it a little bit. So we think that the economy goes up and downs, and that it kind of revolves around the potential for the economy. So we hope that at some point here we're hitting our potential. And so now the trend line you can think of as potential real GDP. which I'm going to use the notation Y, which is our other word, our other symbol for real GDP, even though that's an acronym, so it's like a shorthand notation. Y is usually used for income, but remember from last week we learned that income of the nation is equal to the spending of the nation. So we can look at those two things interchangeably. And so the potential of the economy is kind of this longer run thing. Like how can we squeeze out are there government policies that we can have in place to squeeze out the potential for the economy? Are there some things we could do having entrepreneurship thrive, technological advance? Are some people going to lose their jobs with technological change? Yes, but they'll find new ones, right? That's kind of the idea here of potential real GDP. And then at any given point in time, this is really the short run potential, or the short run GDP. So at any point in time, we can now start to think of this as the actual versus potential. So here we are in, let's say, 20, 2017. This is the actual GDP, and this is the potential. And then in 2020, we had this recession, maybe due to COVID or something, the actual level of GDP was less than potential, right? If we wouldn't have had COVID, maybe we'd be up higher. Does that make sense? Kind of thinking about this distinction between where we're actually at today might be for a variety of circumstances, but here's where we'd like to be, our potential or our possible GDP. Okay, let's bring in the last, the other biggie here of inflation. Another couple nuances that are important with inflation as we work through some things. So let's see, what about inflation? Which 
is a big one today. What about inflation? So we're going to break inflation into two parts, um, anticipated and unanticipated. What about inflation? So we're going to have two different ones here, anticipated inflation, which I'm going to use the pi symbol again. Remember, that was I wrote it out up here, but just kind of anticipated inflation. That's inflation that's expected. So this is expected by the average person. So when, before this crazy inflation started off, were you guys really worried about inflation? Did you think about inflation as a high schooler or <laughs> growing up? We didn't really think about it, right? Why? Because policymakers were pretty successful the last, oh, 30 years, I'd say, 30, 40 years, at keeping inflation low and stable. And that way you guys didn't have to worry about it like we are worrying about it now when we go to the gas station or we go to the grocery store. So our expectation of inflation was shaped by low and stable policy. So our anticipated inflation rate um, can be driven by two things. So previous experience or history. So the example, USA, for a long period of time. I'm gonna leave it kind of vague. We'll get more into this later. But also government policy. So do you think people expected inflation when they started passing out COVID checks like candy? I don't, I think we were kind of all lulled to sleep, but economists like me, and what you're going to learn in this course is that if the government starts cutting thousand dollar checks to everybody, that's something that's going to cause inflation. And so we'd start to anticipate some inflation at some point. All right, then we have the unanticipated. Unanticipated inflation. And that's a lot of what we got now. That is simply unexpected inflation. Which almost sounds kind of dumb, but again, some of us might have been expecting inflation and other people were surprised. So unexpected inflation by the average person. So something, how, why did we have that? Maybe it was an external event that was kind of crazy and how we handled it. So COVID or how about war in Ukraine and Russia, right? Maybe there's been some uh, inflation that's been happening somewhat due to that. So we have unanticipated and anticipated and the mixture of that um, can cause some problems on how we move forward. All right, that looks like a good spot to wrap for today. We'll pick up there tomorrow and march along with showing you some real world stuff, hopefully, one way or the other. We'll either do it on screen or otherwise. Uh, let's see, why don't you guys go ahead and sign the attendance sheet. I should have took that out, but maybe I'll just check boxes here too. Uh, let's see, so Luke and Kennedy got you. Um, so Kennedy's good. Sienna, Chris, gotcha. Kobe was here. Um, Janaya, gotcha. Mariana was here. Robert, Luke. Emily, Javian, and
Jacoby. Anybody here that I didn't call? Give me your names again, sorry. Jaleesa. Simon. You're Jaleesa, okay. I remember seeing you kind of on Zoom. Well, not really, because you're, I don't think your uh, thing was working. Jaleesa and? Andrea. You're Dre. Okay, gotcha. I won't be here tomorrow. You're gone tomorrow, okay. Um, so we'll be wrapping up. Sounds like maybe, were you reading ahead a little bit into the chapter, or? No, I just know. Oh, you knew this, I'm good. <laughs> what are you majoring in? Accounting. So you probably need to add econ, too. Give it some thought. I took uh, econ in high school, uh -huh. so that's what I kind of know already. Okay, where did you go to high school? Science Central. Okay. Um, so some of our best uh, placements 